Okay, I think we're making a start. Um, so my name is Michael Hornberger. I'm a professor of dementia research at the Norwich Medical School. So welcome everybody for joining uh, to today's meeting. So this is our bi-monthly series where we're having either people from UEA for, from outside presenting on their research and how it's relevant basically for people. Um, so I'm just going to uh, do some housekeeping. So um, today, today's speaker is Dr. Keir Young, who's an Alzheimer's Society Fellow from University College London. And uh, Keir is really specialized in kind of visual and spatial awareness changes in dementia. And so he's talking today about changes in perception and spatial awareness. Now, before we go to Keir's talk, uh, just to say that um, if you can, please keep your microphone switched off during the talk and please keep your video switched off during the talk. Um, after we have to, when we have the questions, we're very happy for you to switch on your video again and your microphone. It's just, otherwise can be quite disruptive. How to ask questions. So there's really several options. Uh, one is you can just go to the chat bar uh, in your controls and it will open like a chat box and you can type in your comments or questions or suggestions, uh, which will come up in that. Just make sure that it's to everyone. And then at the end of the talk, we can go through all the, the comments and uh, questions. If you want to ask in, your question in person, then uh, at the end of the talk, please switch on your video, but keep your microphone off. And then I will ask you to switch on your microphone to ask your question. And finally, if your question was not answered or you want more information, and please email us on this uh, email address. Uh, don't worry, we will put the email address at the end of the talk again in the chat, uh, so you will have it there and uh, you can write us any uh, questions. Now, without further ado, yeah, it's my great pleasure to, to welcome uh, Keir, uh, who is really doing great work uh, in, in this area for many years and um, is really at one of the leading uh, dementia centers in the UK and um, down at Queen Square. And um, Kia, if I could just ask you to come on now. And um, so Kia want, is talking today, there he is, on changes in perception and spatial awareness arising in dementia and considering origins and implications for support. So I hand over to you, uh, to you Kia, and um, thank you again for doing this. Well, thank you, Michael, and thank you for the kind invitation to present. I I'm sorry I can't be seeing people uh, face to face. Um, and, and just to emphasize, if people have any questions, whether they want to raise them in the chat uh, or afterwards uh, via email, I'm very happy to answer. So first of all, can I check that you uh, can see my screen okay? Yes, I can see it. Thank you. So as Michael mentioned, my name's Keir. I'm a neuropsychologist and Alzheimer's Society Research Fellow based at University College London. I'll be starting with a very general overview of dementia-related visual impairment. Such impairment refers to difficulties perceiving what or where things are, with these arising not from any eye condition, but rather from the diminished capacity of areas, particularly towards the very back of the brain, in interpreting and representing visual and spatial information. So crucially, today I'll be talking about difficulties with diminished brain sight rather than with diminished eyesight. I'll be talking in particular detail about a form of dementia which is characterized by the early and progressive loss of visual functions, that is posterior cortical atrophy, sometimes referred to as a visual variant of Alzheimer's. I'll discuss in particular detail how Alzheimer's disease can affect different people in such different ways, most notably in the case of posterior cortical atrophy, resulting in changes in visual functions more so than changes in memory. For the later part of this presentation, I'll be going on to discuss some disturbances in spatial awareness that cannot be accounted for by altered visual functions alone. And finally, I'll go on to discuss efforts to apply some of our understanding of dementia related changes in perception and spatial awareness to inform strategies intended to maximize independent activities. <laughs> 
Dementia-related visual impairments are common, yet under-recognized consequences of Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. A substantial proportion of patients with Alzheimer's disease who present normally on eye examination exhibit so-called higher order visual impairments. These can include difficulties in judging depth, having difficulties perceiving faces, for example, having difficulty discriminating the gender of faces, having particular difficulties perceiving things in peripheral relative to central vision, or having difficulty locating where things are in their visual space. Such difficulties may be routinely assessed in clinics with the use of so-called figure copying tasks, where people might be asked to copy, say, these intersecting pentagons, or so-called visual search tasks, where people might be asked to cancel out a certain letter or number on a page of text. Some recent work suggests that of 4,000 patients with so-called typical late onset Alzheimer's disease, so normally experiencing predominantly memory symptoms in their 70s and 80s, around 10 to 16% of patients might have more prominent difficulties on such so-called visuospatial tasks, more so than measures reflecting memory, language, or other aspects of thinking. Visual symptoms are core clinical features of forms of dementia other than Alzheimer's disease. For example, early complex visual hallucinations experienced in dementia with Lewy bodies. Visual symptoms may also arise in forms of dementia where the initial complaints relate to difficulty in people's memory, language, or movements. And this is consistent with the progressive nature of the disease spreading to affect areas, particularly towards the back of the brain. Perhaps unsurprisingly, dementia-related visual impairments fundamentally limit a whole host of everyday activities ranging from independent eating, reading, to navigating one's everyday familiar environment. We've learned a great deal of the nature and basis of dementia-related visual symptoms through working with people living with a condition known as posterior cortical atrophy. Now, in the last 30 years, the terms posterior cortical atrophy, Benson syndrome, the visual variant of Alzheimer's, or more colloquially, Terry Pratchett disease, have often been used interchangeably to refer to a neurodegenerative syndrome which is characterized by the early and progressive loss of visual functions. Now, the term posterior cortical atrophy literally means back of the brain shrinkage. Now, consistent with this, PCA patients tend to have reduced thickness of brain structures in areas presented here in yellow and red towards the very back of the brain and particularly in so-called visual and visual association cortex. Now, these reductions in thickness are more apparent relative to people who have a more typical memory-led form of Alzheimer's disease. And in contrast, people with posterior cortical actually, actually tend to have increased cortical thickness of certain parts of the brain presented here in blue relative to more typical Alzheimer's disease. So these areas broadly correspond to the medial temporal regions that are quite commonly associated with memory function. And consistent with this relative sparing of medial temporal structures and posterior cortical atrophy, PCA patients tend to have relatively preserved memory function, at least at earlier stages of the disease course. Now, in contrast to more typical or well-recognized dementia syndromes, where the earliest symptoms might include difficulties with short-term memory, difficulties with planning or word-finding difficulties, some of the earliest symptoms of posterior cortical actually include difficulty with driving, reading, and perceiving or locating objects presented in clear view. Now, unfortunately, many people with posterior cortical actually often face a very drawn out diagnostic process. Early symptoms may be misinterpreted as stress, anxiety, people being burnt out from work, or symptoms of menopause. Other people are misdiagnosed as having had a stroke. But by far the most common experience relates to seeing one eye health professional after the other. All the while being told that for the visual symptoms people are reporting, that these cannot be accounted for by any eye condition. This not necessarily prompting referral to see a neurologist, neuro-ophthalmologist or dementia specialist. Now, when people tend to think of measures of visual function, the first measure that often occurs to people is that of a standard visual acuity chart. However, for people with posterior cortical atrophy, 
their visual acuity tends to be relatively spared, at least at early to intermediate disease stages. Instead, the difficulties that people with posterior cortical atrophy usually experience are so-called higher order problems in perceiving what or where things are. Over the next few slides, I'm gonna go into some detail about some visual symptoms that are quite characteristic of posterior cortical atrophy, but may also arise in later stages of more typical and memory-led dementia syndromes, but secondary to people's initial memory complaints. Now, a common and often a quite life-limiting consequence of posterior cortical atrophy is a profound difficulty locating where things are in space. And to give you the degree of difficulty experienced by some people in conducting an everyday task such as reading, for some with posterior cortical atrophy, rather than reading out the text presented here as the most outspoken judge on the US Supreme Court has defended the use of some physical interrogation techniques, part of posterior cortical atrophy has read out the text in the following order. The most outspoken judge in the Supreme Court has defended, and then they go back to the first line, Supreme, the most, the BBC could be in the face. And this tendency for people to become lost in a page of text while reading, again, is quite a common symptom of posterior cortical atrophy. In addition to difficulties perceiving words amongst clutter, with things like letters becoming jumbled up within or between words. And in fact, a particularly difficulty perceiving or locating objects amongst very cluttered environments is something that's reported by a great deal of people living with posterior cortical atrophy. A report such as this emphasized the tendency of objects which are close together to sort of merge or combine into one unrecognizable object. And prompted by comments such as this from people with posterior cortical atrophy, and myself and colleagues carried out a series of investigations to get a better understanding of the nature of these so-called cluttering effects. And in particular, under what conditions such effects might be reduced. So we started off by showing very simple stimuli, so these letters presented in isolation to groups of people with posterior cortical atrophy. And for people with PCA, their ability to identify these letters presented by themselves was very good. People barely made any errors. Having presenting these same letters, but now surrounded by visual clutter, these other letters, shapes or numbers, there was a tendency for people to start making errors, but this tendency could be reduced a number of ways. Firstly, by simply presenting objects in isolation. Secondly, by increasing spacing between the target letter and any surrounding visual clutter. And thirdly, by using visual clutter which differed maximally in contrast relative to the central target. By that, I simply mean having visual clutter in white relative to a black target. And some of our interest in this pattern of performance was it sharing certain characteristics with what's known as an early visual processing deficit known as visual crowding. Now, visual crowding is something that limits all of our vision, but particularly in our peripheral vision. It's one of the reasons why it's very difficult for us to pick out a face out of the corner of our eye in a crowd of people. And it's one of the reasons why it's very difficult for us to read using our peripheral vision. However, people with posterior cortical atrophy are experiencing difficulties perceiving clutter that are in line with crowding, but in their central vision. A striking and counterintuitive complaint from some people with posterior cortical atrophy is a particular difficulty perceiving large relative to small objects. And this is something that was very neatly summarized by a patient who attended the clinic who mentioned that they had a great deal of difficulty recognizing the headline of a newspaper that was right in front of them. However, we're looking towards the end of the train carriage they were sat on, had a great deal less difficulty perceiving the very same headline that someone else was reading when presented at a distance, i.e. when that headline was perceptually small. And this particular difficulty perceiving large relative to small objects has been noted across a range of case studies and group studies and while the basis of this so-called inverse size effect is yet unclear, with some suggesting it might represent a restriction in the effective visual field where objects of a certain size are in interperiphal vision and thus are more difficult to perceive, where this has clear implications is in asking the question, 
or what are appropriate aids, adaptations, or strategies to support someone who has diminished visual function owing to neurodegenerative disease. For example, you might have someone with posterior cortical atrophy who will go to a low vision clinic and say, I've got difficulty with my reading. And they might be provided with some aid or technology which would blow up the font size of text, if anything, making it more difficult for that person to read. And I'm just presenting this same acuity chart now to stimulate thinking about how for someone who might be experiencing visual disorientation and be getting lost going from one line of the chart to the next, or say for someone who's got a particular difficulty perceiving objects amongst clutter, that they might struggle with say locating the O uh, towards the center of the chart and maybe have less difficulties with items on the perimeter of the chart. Or say for someone who might have particular difficulty perceiving large relative to small objects, that clearly all of these serve as particular challenges in both the administration and interpretation of even this superficially simple visual measure for people who are experiencing dementia-related visual loss. Now, there's a common cause of posterior cortical atrophy is Alzheimer's disease pathology, and hence the uh, occasional moniker of visual variant Alzheimer's. Posterior cortical atrophy raises some key questions regarding why and how Alzheimer's disease can affect different people in very different ways. Over the next few slides, I'll be presenting individuals with posterior cortical atrophy who have so-called molecular or pathological evidence for Alzheimer's disease. So re relating to these hallmark plaques and tangles, yet experience changes in their perception and spatial awareness in contrast to relatively spared memory. Presented here are MRI scans provided by a participant who volunteered for research as a control participant at University College London, but who subsequently went on to develop posterior cortical atrophy over the course of his participation. And presented here are images showing contraction of regions towards the very back of the brain in green and blue over a period of seven years. Now, some of the contraction, especially in earlier stages, really emphasizes loss towards the back of the brain in areas that we consider to be visual and visual association cortex. So things like occipital regions, posterior parietal and occipital temporal regions. This person passed away in 2015, upon which he received a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease at autopsy. Some of the earliest symptoms he reported included difficulty with reading, with him becoming lost on a page of text. He reported difficulty interpreting analog clocks, feeling less confident walking down stairs, and diminished calculation and handwriting skills. And these stand in contrast to some of the more uh, characteristic symptoms associated with Alzheimer's disease, namely things to do with, say, memory. Initial cognitive assessment noted impaired performance on tasks that feature prominent visual components, as well as space and object perception tasks. In fact, he only performed below the normal range on verbal measures of memory function years after suspicion of posterior cortical atrophy was first raised. His participant also took part in a large multi-center investigation of posterior cortical atrophy progression. Estimates of changes in brain volumes over time are presented here, posterior cortical atrophy, compared to people with more typical Alzheimer's disease. Now, such changes over time are consistent with the particular vulnerability of regions towards the back of the brain, so including parietal and occipital regions, as well as the relative resilience of regions that are more characteristically associated with Alzheimer's disease, so the medial temporal structures in posterior cortical atrophy, more so compared to typical Alzheimer's. Now, in recent years, Molecular imaging techniques have enabled visualization of some of the hallmark pathology associated with Alzheimer's disease, but in vivo. And presented here on the left from top to bottom is increased tau PET trace uptake, decreased FDG PET trace uptake, and increased amyloid PID PET uptake in a group of PCA participants' relative controls. With these in emphasizing the increased tau PET trace uptake and hypermetabolism, so reduced glucose uptake towards the very back of the brain, whereas amyloid deposition does not show the same correspondence with clinical presentation and symptoms. 
presented here from the left is individual posterior cortical atrophy, someone with logopenic variant of prime aggressive aphasia, so characterized by language difficulties, and someone with typical memory-led Alzheimer's disease. Now, these are showing how regional tau pet trace uptake is broadly consistent with the symptoms that people are experiencing. So predominantly from left to right, visual-led, language-led, so showing this predominance of the left hemisphere, and to the far right, memory-led. Now, some key questions raised by posterior cortical atrophy really relate to understanding the striking variability that's so evident across the Alzheimer's disease spectrum. Now, in particular, why might some people have the same underlying pathology, yet differ quite drastically in terms of the symptoms they're experiencing? Might there be any mechanisms that relate to the relative sparing of the medial temporal lobes I presented here? And by understanding factors associated with such mechanisms, can this give us any clues into the development of future therapeutic strategies? Now, this recent Lancet Neurology Review into atypical Alzheimer's disease refers to individuals who have the pathological hallmarks of Alzheimer's, so these plaques and tangles, but whose initial and prominent symptoms do not characteristically relate to memory. Instead, their symptoms may relate to difficulties with vision and spatial awareness, such as in posterior cortical atrophy, or in other individuals with language, planning, behavior, and movement. Now, such individuals are overrepresented in people who are considered to have young onset forms of Alzheimer's disease. By this, I mean people who typically experience symptoms in their 50s and 60s. Now, beyond raising some fundamental research questions regarding why Alzheimer's disease may result in different symptoms, this review makes recommendations for appropriate support and treatment for people with posterior cortical atrophy. It also recommends that people with posterior cortical atrophy may be eligible to register as being partially sighted, even if their visual difficulties arise from brain sight rather than eyesight difficulties. Now here I've highlighted this proposed domain level uh, terminology regarding posterior cortical atrophy, so referring to visual spatial Alzheimer's disease. Over the next part of this presentation, I'll be focusing on changes in spatial awareness that cannot be accounted for by diminished visual functions alone. Now, some earlier work in this area include an investigation where we presented sounds to people with posterior cortical atrophy through headphones. So these sounds were manipulated so that they appear to come from different parts of auditory space. So, for example, it is at, you're at the cinema and you know, sounds that are being played from the front or behind, left or to your right. Now, overall, people with posterior cortical atrophy, as well as people with more memory-led Alzheimer's disease, had particular difficulty discriminating whether sounds were presented from the same or different parts of their auditory space. Now, perhaps a real-world or everyday analogy might be if someone's calling your name in a crowd of people, being able to recognize your name being called, but having difficulty pinpointing exactly where they're calling you from. Now, some more recent work includes a group of PCA participants who again presented sounds through headphones. So this time, these sounds were manipulated so they were presented either one at a time or jointly. And for people with posterior cortical atrophy, and particular difficulty distinguishing sounds when presented jointly versus those presented in isolation. Such findings are perhaps consistent with the so-called cocktail party phenomenon involving people having particular difficulty perceiving an auditory object, so for example, my voice while I'm speaking, over any background noise, and may extend previously discussed effects of visual clutter on object perception to the auditory domain, and think about possible effects of auditory clutter on scene perception. Now, while posterior cortical atrophy is occasionally referred to as visual variant Alzheimer's disease, Actually, it's not surprising that many uh, symptoms of PCA um, lack an explicit visual component. In fact, uh, many functions to do with things like calculation, spelling, complex learned actions, and handwriting are reliant on the integrity of brain structures towards the back of the brain, 
and many early symptoms of posterior cortical atrophy in fact lack an explicit visual basis. This can include people who have difficulty with things like manipulating certain buttons, clasps, or zips during dressing, others who might have difficulty locating the sleeves of a jacket behind themselves. Others still might report particular difficulty getting around the home at night time or with reliably transferring from standing to sitting. And some of the complex disturbances in sense of phase experienced in posterior cortical atrophy were perhaps at best articulated by one lady with posterior cortical atrophy who asked her daughter, am I the right way up while sitting? Or another participant who reported a dramatic room tilt who conducted some of the most detailed investigations of the perception of upright and standing balance in posterior cortical atrophy and more memory-led Alzheimer's disease. We evaluated multiple sensory systems, not only visual, but vestibular, so head acceleration, and proprioceptive, so an active sense of joint movement and body position. We investigated how the functioning of these different sensory systems and communication between these systems related to disturbances in balance and spatial orientation. Now, it's no simple question of how we orientate ourselves in our immediate space. Presented here is an example of where we might sense a horizontal turn based on a combination of visual, vestibular, and proprioceptive information. Here's where we might sense the same turn, but with a lesser contribution of proprioceptive sense from our own body senses. And here's where you might sense the same turn but in the absence of any vision information. Disabling consequences of difficulty orientating in the horizontal planes include problems with estimating heading and we're getting lost in both familiar and unfamiliar environments. Consequences of difficulty orientating in the vertical planes include balance disturbances and postural abnormalities. And for the purpose of this presentation, I'll be talking about difficulties orientating in the vertical planes, but almost exclusively in the frontal plane. And the posterior parietal lobes are key candidate sites for interpreting, spatially representing, and transforming information from multiple senses, owing to the vulnerability of these regions in Alzheimer's disease, and particularly so in posterior cortical atrophy. We hypothesize that disturbances in the perception of upright and standing balance will be most apparent in posterior cortical atrophy relative to more typical Alzheimer's disease, relative to healthy controls. With these relating to the altered interpretation of visual information and of a miscombination of different types of sensory information. So groups of participants with posterior cortical atrophy, people with more memory than Alzheimer's disease and healthy controls were invited to take part in a series of tasks evaluating the perception of upright and balance, but controlling and manipulating different types of sensory information, visual, vestibular, and proprioceptive. I'll be talking about three tasks. These are visual vertical, standing balance, and haptic eye grasping vertical. I'd like to note that two of these tasks could really be considered as evaluating what looks or what feels to be upright. For the visual vertical task, participants were asked to manually orientate a visually presented bar to be as upright as possible. And they did this with the use of a large handheld rotating dial. Participants were sat upright with their head and torso in a fixed position and this ensured the consistency of sensory information from participants' own head and body senses. The bar was projected on a screen in front of participants within the darkened room, and participants could take as long as they liked to perform this task. For a number of trials, the bar was presented within a visual orientation cue, so this square frame, which influences the perception of upright. And a modest influencing or biasing effect is normally observed in healthy participants in the direction of the tilted frame. I'm going to start by presenting you error in the absence of any cues and regardless of direction. Overall, PCA participants who are presented here as red dots are showing the greatest degree of difficulty in this task. I'm now going to present to you error 
average across Q conditions in both directions. Both patient groups with posterior cortical atrophy and more memory-led Alzheimer's disease are showing an exaggerated effect of these visual cues influencing their perception of upright. Now, this suggests that visual information is playing a heightened role in influencing the perception upright in patients. However, it's worth noting that this superficially simple task requires the cross-referencing of this visually perceived bar with an internal representation of what's upright. And this representation of what's upright relies on not one, but multiple sensory systems. Now, correspondingly, for our second task, we investigated how standing upright relies on communication between different sensory systems. Now, to do this, we use a technique known as galvanic vestibular simulation. So this administers what's known as a pure vestibular stimulus through an electrode placed in the back of the ear, which prompts a sensation of apparent head movement. So this feeling of apparent head movement in turn prompts a whole body balance response in the opposite direction. Now, crucially, we can introduce or restrict other types of sensory information when administering galvanic vestibular stimulation. And in this way, we can investigate how the communication between different sensory systems mediates balance. So for example, if I was standing upright with my eyes closed and I administered galvanic vestibular stimulation to myself, you might see me making quite a large balance response. And this is despite my body sensors telling me that I'm standing upright and I'm stationary, while my head sensors are telling me that I'm moving. However, with my eyes now open, I'm getting lots of additional information about my visual environment. So cues about my orientation and self-movement, which enable me to somewhat mediate, dampen or suppress this balanced response. So for the standing balance task, we ask participants to stand upright with their feet positioned closely together. And in this way, we limited the amount of information participants would get from their body senses. So participants were standing upright in a harness, which would catch them if they move too far in any direction. The mm -hmm. stimulation was administered so that the head appeared to move left or right, prompting a balance response in the opposite direction. Vision was either made available or restricted with the use of wearable goggles. And for a number of trials when vision was restricted, we introduced different proprioceptive conditions orientating the head left, right, or in line with the body midline. So in this way, we investigated how vestibular and visual or vestibular and proprioceptive systems interacted in order to control balance. Now, I'm going to present to you balance response here, which is defined by displacement at the level of the neck, but in the absence of any visual information. Overall, it seems that balance responses are quite comparable across all three participant groups. This is just that patients overall are making good use of vestibular information, at least in the absence of any visual information. I'm now going to present to you balance response, but with available vision. The PCA group is showing an exaggerated balance response relative to that of patrols. In contrast, the typical Alzheimer's disease group is showing a balance response that's broadly comparable uh, to controls overall. Now, this suggests that PCA participants aren't making use of visual information as in the other participant groups. If anything, it suggests that they're using visual information less relative to vestibular information in maintaining their balance. Now, for the haptic or grasping vertical task, participants were asked to manually orientate a physically held bar to be as upright as possible. Participants were sat upright and critically, they perform this task without any visual information of the held bar of their own body or of the environment. Now, I'm going to present to you error defined from both frontal and sagittal planes. So this could really be thought of error in terms of 3D angle. By far the greatest difficulty experienced on this task is by the PCA group. And this is despite this task lacking any explicit visual components 
and the term of visual variant Alzheimer's. Some of our interest in these findings is whether they relate to reports from participants of having difficulty locating parts of the body in space, so for example, and having difficulty locating the sleeves of the jacket behind themselves while getting dressed, or for others are reporting uh, difficulty locating, say, uh, where an arm is when obscured in a piece of clothing um, during dressing activities. So I presented some findings suggesting the comparable responses to vestibular stimulation across all three participant groups. This suggests overall that patient participants are reliably interpreting vestibular information, at least in the absence of any visual information. Now I presented some findings suggesting the altered interpretation of visual information that may seem at least superficially difficult to reconcile. On the one hand, it seems that visual information is playing an elevated role in influencing the perception of upright in both patient groups. How, if anything, it seems that PTA participants are using visual information less in maintaining their balance. This apparent discrepancy may relate to some previous work suggesting PCA participants having particular difficulty making use of visual information, which is in the far uh, visual periphery. And this has been referred to as the so-called inverse size effect or restriction the effective visual field. And it might be that information in our far uh, visual periphery is particularly helpful in providing us with cues about our orientation and self-movement in order to maintain our balance. And an alternative information might be that the exaggerated effect of visual cues influencing the perception of right in both patient groups might somehow be in response to a noisy somatosensory system uh, to do with, again, sensing more uh, body information. As evidence says, the particularly poor performance on the haptic vertebral task, again, a task which lacks any visual information. And some of our interest is whether some of these difficulties with the haptic vertebral task to some of the increased demands in having to transform information between uh, different frames of reference. So say from a head to body center coordinates to postural arm configuration and then the hands themselves. Some of our ongoing work has been relating these disturbances in spatial awareness to everyday consequences for people's independence. I'm going to present to you whole body uh, movement sensor data for participant with posterior cortical atrophy who's been asked to sit in this chair. You can see how she's having difficulty with this task sitting on the armrest or on the seat of the chair itself. I'm now going to present to you some more movement center data, this time from someone who's been diagnosed with more memory-led Alzheimer's disease, but at a later stage of the disease course, but being asked to conduct this same task. Now, clearly, for someone experiencing this degree of difficulty with transferring from standing to sitting, it's difficult not to imagine the sort of implications this might have for their everyday independence, and indeed for the nature and extent of support in managing certain everyday tasks. And when I work with people living with posterior cortical atrophy, they often mention they need a little bit of help, but with a range of things. At a point in someone's diagnosis where things like memory, language, and insight might be very well preserved, People might require assistance with getting a drink, putting on their shoes, or navigating their everyday environment. And prompted by some of these really life-limiting consequences of dementia-related visual impairments, over a number of years, we've been conducting a body of work, core to which involves harnessing the unique perspectives of people living with posterior cortical atrophy, who are experiencing dementia-related visual symptoms at the earliest stages of the disease course in order to better understand dementia-related visual loss arising in later stages of more typical forms of dementia, but at a point whereby people's concurrent difficulties in their memory and language might make it that much more difficult for them to articulate any visual symptoms they might be experiencing. Ultimately, 
we hope to develop practical aids and strategies uh, to help mitigate the effects of dementia-related visual loss. Through a series of home visits, we gained an idea not only of parts of the home that people with posterior cortical atrophy and people with more memory and Alzheimer's disease are struggling to negotiate on a day-to-day -day basis, but what strategy any people are currently using to manage parts of the home. And presented here are examples of the strategic use of color or contrast in picking out objects within cluttered environments or emphasizing the location of a certain object around the home. And presented here are some more elaborate examples of lighting-based aids, often operating on a principle of emphasizing the location of a certain target destination or floor path to a destination within the home. Now, consider these examples of investigations that people living with posterior cortical atrophy, people with more memory and Alzheimer's disease, and their families are conducting within their own homes across the United Kingdom. Through working with colleagues in University College London's engineering department, we conducted a series of investigations within a accessibility laboratory that I can only really describe to you as a large warehouse space. Now, an advantage that this space offers is it enables us to construct everyday environments intended to simulate uh, everyday domestic settings. So, for example, an open plan room, a series of stairs or corridors. We have a great deal of control over certain aspects of the physical environment. But crucially, we can introduce aids that are informed through our more basic cognitive or neuropsychological investigations or strategies which have been shared with us by individual participants and their families. And we can see whether introducing these aids or uh, adaptations supports the ability of people living with various degrees of dementia-related visual loss to more reliably and confidently reach certain destinations or objects. As an example task, we were interested in whether the use of a strategic contrast or lighting might facilitate more efficient navigation to visible target destinations. Now present here, we take from a participant with posterior cortical atrophy, the circle shows their recorded gaze position, and what this shows is a combined contrast and um, a movement cue. So this motion effect is achieved with a set of LEDs. Some of our interest in such cues are not only followed on from some strategies shared by people in their own homes, but also reports of people with posterior cortical atrophy who seem better able to locate um, objects that are quite conspicuous uh, within their uh, visual environment. So people who might have difficulty sometimes locating objects that are right in front of them, but on other occasions might reach down and with quite remarkable accuracy, pick up say a coin or piece of fluff off the floor. The introduction of this motion cue was prompted by some people with posterior cortical atrophy who seem better able to locate moving relative to static objects. Now our primary outcome measure for whether or not these cues were effective in facilitating uh, people reaching these destinations was simply time taken to reach destinations. Overall in our combined patient groups, this is with people with posterior cortical atrophy and more memory and Alzheimer's disease, there was evidence overall that uh, patient participants were more efficient reaching destinations in the presence of the simple contrast cue. In fact, there was no evidence that the addition of this motion effect resulted in increased task efficiency. Now, the advantage this space offers is it allows us to formally evaluate certain reports from people that seem quite counterintuitive. And a, a common problem um, by many people with posterior cortical atrophy is difficulty negotiating um, certain environments where there's a lot of perceptual variation or flooring where there's a lot of, say, stark reflections, uh, glare, and shadows. Now presented here on the left is actually a photo taken from the home of one participant who was diagnosed with more memory and Alzheimer's disease, which is um, considered to be quite problematic in negotiating on an everyday basis. And to the right here is a photograph taken from my local pharmacy, but just showing an example of glare and some perceptual variation introduced to help people with maintaining social distancing. Now some reports of people with serial cortical atrophy may be quite unsettling with some people suggesting that when there's a lot of reflection of stances, this can be misperceived as being a sheer drop. And prompted by reports and participants 
conducted investigations not into the overall levels of lighting, so bright versus dark, but rather the consistency of lighting within a controlled environment. And by adjusting uh, the layout of objects within a room and the position of overhead lighting, we're able to create three so-called shadow conditions. From left to right, we consider these to be high, medium, and no. Again, our primary outcome of our performance was time taken to reach destinations. And there was evidence that in the posterior cortical atrophy group, uh, people were at their most efficient reaching destinations when restricting shadows interrupting the floor path. So that's in the no shadow condition on the right hand side, relative to the high shadow condition. There was no evidence of an effect of shadows in either the typical Alzheimer's or control groups. Now I'm going to present to you some data which is acquired from wearable movement sensors. So these are taken from a bird's eye view just for people with posterior cortical atrophy, and it shows people walking to both left and right hand side destinations. So first of all, you can see some examples of indirect walking past the destinations presented here in grey. But I'd like to draw your attention to these markers. Um, so what these markers indicate are steps which are disproportionately slow relative to a participant's usual walking speed. These could be considered to be markers of uh, slow or hesitant steps. And there's a tendency for these so-called hesitant steps to be occurring to a lesser extent when, again, restricting shadows interrupting the floor path. There's also a suggestion that the location of these hesitant steps seems to be leading up to these stark areas of light and dark. And some of our interest in such approaches is really in implementing them in more everyday environments and in community settings to get a better understanding of aspects of the environment that might help or hinder people's everyday activities. Now, as mentioned previously, an early symptom posterior cortical atrophy is diminished reading ability. And as an opportunity to recap on certain visual symptoms, and in particular, how they might limit reading at a text level, in the next slide, I'm going to show a crude depiction of, say, for someone who's experiencing difficulties in perceiving things in clutter, this tendency for words to jumble or, or clutter up on a page of text. For someone who might be experiencing a diminished perception of information in their peripheral vision, here's a depiction of how it might be to really struggle picking up things that are in the periphery. And presented here is an example of someone who might be visually disorientated becoming lost in a page of text. And clearly, uh, these uh, three symptoms may interact amongst each other. So say for someone losing their page of text, it can be particularly difficult to find the right word uh, to continue with if they also have this um, unreliable uh, perception of information in far peripheral vision. But when conducting a series of tasks involving presenting news articles to people with posterior cortical atrophy, we found that people's ability to read certain words was quite good. So presented here in a darker shade of green are words that were read out more accurately, more consistently in a group of 15 people with posterior cortical atrophy. Now these more accurate words tend to be towards earlier parts of text and also on the perimeter of paragraphs rather than towards the center of each paragraph of text itself. And this is perhaps consistent with the notion that words towards the center of uh, paragraphs are more susceptible to these cluttering or crowding effects. Prompted by these findings, we trialed reading aids based on a very simple premise that reducing some of the spatial demands of reading by asking people to maintain their gaze in the fixation box at the center of the screen, thus removing the need for people to be directing their gaze or attention all around a page of text, and showing words in chunks, so two words at a time, thus minimizing the amount of adjacent words that could be adversely acting as visual clutter, that such approaches might promote more accurate and pleasant reading. And we found that overall in our group of participants that people's reading accuracy increased from around 50 to 60% overall. So that's with standard text presentation all at the same time to more like 90 to 95% using these serial text presentation techniques. And some subsequent work led by my colleague Ida Suarez Gonzalez has since incorporated these and other findings in development of assistive technology 
by working through a process of co-development with a group of people who steer a core to write theme. Ultimately, with this technology to promote reading as an independent activity into the disease cause. And just as in summary, I've talked about how dementia-related visual loss um, is often a consequence of Alzheimer's disease, which can be overlooked, um, but unfortunately um, is diverse and likely differs in many of its principles in management compared to, say, um, uh, visual loss owing to an ocular or eye basis. Further complicating this picture are disturbances in spatial awareness that can't be accounted for by changes in visual function alone. I presented a number of studies which suggest that the visual environment may play a heightened role for both people with posterior cortical atrophy and people with more memory-led Alzheimer's disease. So this is both in the case of visual cues, which seem to have an exaggerated effect on the perception of upright, as well as on people's ability um, to navigate based on visual information, uh, as well as some uh, exaggerated effect of lighting variability in posterior cortical atrophy and effects of clutter across a number of tasks. I particularly like to emphasize and acknowledge the role of people living with posterior cortical atrophy and people with more memory Alzheimer's disease and their families, not only in initially steering these avenues of research, um, as noted by quotes from people throughout, but later on in fulfilling the translation of potential of research, whether that's through sharing some of their own example management strategies or later on in co-developing assistive technology. I'd particularly like to thank all, all participants uh, and caregivers who've taken part in this research, and I'd like to thank you for your attention. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Keir. Uh, that was a really great presentation on uh, PCA. I learned a lot, so that's good. <laughs> I hope everybody else learned a lot as well. Uh, really fascinating, and uh, all the work you've done over these years in looking at uh, Visual impairment and spatial awareness is really fantastic, um, and I, I really, I'm really happy to see this now moving into more, as you say, assistive technology and really recommendations. Because, of course, as you know, this is always what the families and people with dementia ask us for. You know, this is all very good that you do your research, but what does it mean to us? So it's really great that you have the theoretical grounding, and then you can now develop the, the interventions from that. So just a reminder to everybody, if you want to type your questions, please, in the chat, please do so. Uh, also, if you want to come on, ask your question in person, just switch on your video and I'll take you one in turn. I have a first question actually from Carolyn Patterson. And uh, Carolyn asks, uh, in virtually all of the graphs that you presented, there are few PCA patients whose performance is in a normal range. Mm. Is this just the expected variation in any group or is it a kind of measure of severity or length of disease? So it's a great question. We definitely see routinely across a number of tasks, uh, people who vary quite a lot in terms of uh, where they are in the disease course and also in their presentation of PCA. Um, so something that comes to my mind is, um, while until recently, I thought it was quite remarkable that I'd seen someone a few years ago who had an MSc of 13 on his first assessment, even being able to do uh, intersecting pectigons on his second attempt. That actually, it's not strictly speaking fair to say that it's only been in recent years that people are reaching a diagnosis in such a, a timely and prompt manner. The, the, there's, there's also been people, say, 10 years ago, who I think quite um, fortunately their PCO was picked up at quite an early stage. Uh, but the, the point I'm making is that we do see some people who, again, it's a matter of months after diagnosis, who still are performing very well uh, on a number of tasks as well as people who may be years after uh, first noticing symptoms. And then further complicating this picture is that, again, we do see some variability within the PCA syndrome itself. Um, I'm sure Karen is more, more than familiar with the proposed uh, uh, variants from say a more dorsal or bipartial form of posterior cortical atrophy that might have most prominent, say, visual spatial difficulties, uh, maybe some problems with practice skills, compared to say someone who might have a more ventral presentation might be characterized by single word recognition difficulties and face perception problems. Say this more elusive caudal form that might be characterized by more 
basic visual difficulties, say with central chromatopsia, maybe some quite reliable hemianopia. So all these could serve as well to perhaps complicate the interpretation of any single plot and a number of PCA participants who seem to who appear to be performing within the normal range on that particular task. Yeah, so as always, it's heterogeneous, isn't it? That's the issue in a way how people present. Now, I have a raised hand by uh, Anayo Unachufku. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Anayo, do you want to ask your question? Yes, my question. Thank you for such a wonderful presentation. I'm just wondering, um, there's um, the, um, the current research in advanced physiology where they tell people to stand on one uh, one leg and um, and sometimes close your eyes and you know and they are saying that a problem may be quite helpful in terms of the interconnectivity and probably may be helpful with brain health. So I'm just wondering, is that something that uh, you identify with? Because I find this talk very fascinating and I, I could actually tease out a few things that may be useful in terms of looking at the advanced physiology. So just to disclose, I'm definitely not a physiologist by background. So I'm a neuropsychologist. And in fact, my domain is really focused on, on visual information. So this is still an area that's quite new to me. But I think, yeah, the, the interest in conducting the same task with and without visual feedback is people throw around the term, you know, uh, PCA is the canonical visual dementia or visual variant Alzheimer's disease, I think of, often kind of quite casually sometimes, but it seems to be, if anything, and we have some preliminary uh, data on this, which unfortunately has been halted uh, clearly by COVID, that actually for some tasks, really if you take vision out of the equation, people really seem to struggle. If you're removing that visual feedback, people can really struggle with certain tasks. And that, I'm not talking specifically about things like uh, standing balance tasks, but things like uh, being asked to say, uh, locate uh, information uh, really based on proprioceptive sense. Um, and this might, uh, again, align with reports we hear of people where they already struggle to locate sleeves of a jacket behind themselves or people who report real difficulties getting around the home at nighttime. And also with that, some people suggesting management strategies, which include things like night lights or motion sensor lights, which have perhaps been intended to address this issue of um, people really struggling um, when you, in the absence of any visual feedback. Great, and then so we have a, a comment from Helen Eames. Uh, she said it was really interesting, especially aspects of home environment. She has a question. So she is still not sure, is PCA a part of Alzheimer's disease or should it be regarded as a separate condition? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And I think, to be honest, it probably complicated things for a number of years where you would have certain people who might consider posterior cortical atrophy to be equivalent as an atypical presentation of Alzheimer's disease. But I think it's fair to say the overall consensus view, and that that's really emphasizing uh, the only existing uh, consensus criteria for posterior cortical atrophy, is really to consider PCA at both the syndromic level, so based principally on some of the uh, core cognitive features, as well as having established a neurodegenerative basis. Um, but then as you move down into more uh, biomarker supported or where we have pathological evidence for an underlying cause to then consider say someone who might have posterior cortical atrophy, but who says has a lumbar puncture and the cerebral spinal fluid profile is compatible with underlying Alzheimer's disease to perhaps refer to that person as having PCAAD, so PCA Alzheimer's disease. But in, in some cases, well, it's probably fair to say that at least three quarters of documented people with serial cortical atrophy um, have underlying Alzheimer's disease and whether evidence is available, um, that PCA can also be caused by Lewy body pathology, uh, other rare neurogenic diseases like cortical basal degeneration, in rare cases, very rare cases, prion disease. And there's even a few case reports of people who have very uh, rare mutations that are normally associated with frontal temporal dementia um, but actually have a, a posterior cortical atrophy clinical presentation. So um, apologies for the long-winded response, but it's just to give you a sense of, it, it's, it's a complex picture, but I think we can consider posterior cortical atrophy as a syndrome with multiple underlying causes, but it's most closely and intimately associated with Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause, and some people would consider posterior cortical atrophy to be the most common atypical presentation of Alzheimer's. Yes, complex, isn't it? And we have uh, several questions from Russell Simpson. Um, 
he asked, does the brain shrink in size due to PCA or is the damage to the brain which causes PCA? So like a chicken and qu and egg question. Are there, is the disease causing the brain to shrink or is the brain shrinkage causing the disease? So I, want, I would want to say with a reasonable amount of certainty uh, that people would consider the pathology to really be initiating this process, this pathological cascade resulting in the loss of uh, gray matter volume, um, particularly in regions towards the very back of the brain in the case of posterior cortical atrophy. So the occipital region, posterior parietal, occipital temporal regions. So you could argue that actually posterior cortical atrophy itself is being caused by some underlying cause. I just talked about Alzheimer's disease, but as also mentioned, it could be say Lewy body pathology for some people. Um, but I think what slightly complicates this further is that there's some suggestions, I think based on kind of preliminary work that you might have some people who might be more susceptible to some kind of regional vulnerability based on some insult early on in life or some reorganization that's perhaps atypical early on in life. Um, I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done in this area. And actually in the Lancet review I mentioned, under more needed to know, we really emphasize, while there might be some suggestion that perhaps of developmental abnormalities, I think this is an area that's in its relative infancy in terms of research. And he, has another, PCA, sorry. Yeah. he has another question. How many people are diagnosed with PCA in the UK? Do you know roughly a number for that? So unfortunately, I think another thing that's complicated uh, estimates of prevalence and incidence of posterior cortical atrophy Number one is the inconsistency in previous clinical criteria and in the application of such criteria. Uh, and the fact that it's pretty clear that a lot of people with posterior cortical atrophy take a very long time to reach diagnosis or, or simply don't reach a diagnosis. By the time someone is seen by a dementia specialist, things progress to the point where it's a more global profile um, of, of people's symptoms. Um, it's difficult to pick out. It could be someone who's got prominent visual and memory symptoms, for instance. But estimates based off single center studies, which wouldn't really constitute true epidemiological studies, uh, might suggest that as a proportion of people attending specialist clinics, it could be between say eight to 13% of people, 13. And that includes people who might have say prominent difficulty with uh, praxis, so complex learned actions and spelling and handwriting in addition to visual symptoms. Great, then uh, Elaine Mercer has a question. My father was diagnosed with PCA about three years ago. He has had glaucoma for decades and is almost blind in one eye now. I had wondered if there was a link between glaucoma and PCA. Has this been linked at all? Has this been researched between more peripheral versus central visual conditions? So the work I'm aware of has uh, used uh, OCT, so a measure of uh, really the structural integrity and thickness of the retina in people with posterior cortical atrophy. And at the group level, um, there was no evidence of differences in people with posterior cortical atrophy relative to people with more memory and Alzheimer's disease or indeed relative to healthy controls. But of course, that's one group study. Um, in, in terms of, uh, again, as you say, a kind of peripheral um, or eyesight condition, um, just to emphasize that for people to fulfill criteria for a diagnosis of posterior cortical atrophy, the visual symptoms they're experiencing can't be accounted for by an eye condition, brain tumor, or stroke. But that's not to say that some people with posterior cortical atrophy, as clearly in the case of your father, can also have an eye condition along with posterior cortical atrophy, so a concurrent um, eyesight and brain sight difficulty. Um, but yeah, to my knowledge, there's nothing at this point suggesting that uh, things like uh, an early eye, eyesight condition increases people's risk of developing posterior cortical atrophy. And if anything, I think actually for people with posterior cortical atrophy, given how it tends to be young onset in presentations, so most people will experience symptoms, say, in their late 50s or, or 60s, that actually we tend to see quite a low uh, prevalence of um, eyesight conditions, at least in people who I work with. Great. So let's, um, I, I realize we're running out of time, but maybe we can go through a few quite quickly. So there's a question, how can someone get to PCA diagnosis, which I think is a difficult question, but how should they best approach this care from your experience in terms of if they're worried about having PCA? So I have to emphasize, I'm not a clinician here. Um, 
And I, I also want to provide some reassurance that I think it's fair to say in the last 10 years, there have been big shifts in general understanding amongst professionals about dementia in general and including what might be considered to be atypical or unusual forms of dementia. So, for example, uh, our, our group, just as one, um, yeah, as one group amongst many, uh, I, Michael has also done a lot of public and professional engagement work, is that we've reached out to people like the College of Optometrists um, and uh, put together a series of training with optometrists and neurologists and ophthalmologists to get a better understanding about how to re reliably assess diminished visual function in people with posterior cortical atrophy, whether that's at a brain site or eyesight level. Um, so I think that's the route a lot of people take. Sadly, a lot of people feel they've been in a limbo of seeing eye health professionals, you know, including some ophthalmologists who unfortunately won't necessarily make the connection that, okay, well, the visual symptoms people are reporting, you know, these can't be explained by uh, a primary ocular condition, but that not necessarily prompting referral to see a neurologist, say, or a neuro-ophthalmologist. But I, I don't want to single out these particular professional groups because we do see people with serial cortical atrophy who've been diagnosed by psychiatrists, geriatricians, it, it very much depends on the consultant, uh, but I think it, it can be helpful, well, first and foremost, obviously, to speak with your GP if you've got concerns, uh, but maybe think about uh, services which are used to seeing people with young onset forms of dementia, if possible, which often overlaps with neurology, but not exclusively. There's, there's a nice study called the Angela Project, which is looking at pathways for diagnosis of people with young onset dementia, for, for yeah, in, more down the psychiatry route. Yeah, it's complex, isn't it? Um, I think there's a statement more from Susan Anderson, and she, well, maybe a rhetorical question. How long before the research and anecdotal evidence translates to changes in health and social care systems? The care homes, hospitals, daycare centers may support those with dementia, but not those with sensory difficulties, mm. and workers may not understand. We really need urgent understanding of PCA in these systems. For example, it can affect continents, that so people cannot see the, the, the toilet or manage clothing to end up being treated as incontinent and PCA affecting balance means more likelihood of falls and accidents. But again, this isn't really taken into account in the current system. I guess we can all agree with us. There's just much more work to do to, to communicate, especially, I guess, more, uh, you know, less typical forms of Alzheimer's disease. Would you agree with that, Keir? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And just to start off with, I think UEA is well placed also to be leading developments in this area because it's both health and social care. So I, I'm aware that they have uh, MSc uh, for uh, social workers and they train occupational therapists who work in these settings. So that's just one example of work that, that's already going on within UEA. Um, I can say as an individual researcher myself, because my first role was within care home settings, Again, this was over 10 years ago, but I think it's probably fair to say there are still big uh, gaps in terms of communication uh, and cross-skilling between these different areas and different professional groups. The ways I've attempted to address that personally is I've developed uh, CBD training with the Royal College of uh, Occupational Therapists. We're currently updating that now. Um, and the and as, and not, as long as, um, so in addition to engagement work with optometrists, I've done talks with the Margaret Butterworth Care Home Forum to care home professionals, and also will present on dementia-related visual changes to uh, residents and relatives meetings, service user meetings and staff meetings at care homes and day centers. But I think an issue here is that there's, there's a limit to what I, I can do often. And I think the issue, which you're going to be much more familiar with than I am with some care home providers, to take one example, is that they could have so many uh, uh, different um, sites, so many different facilities, that it's how you really tackle that. So I've gone in a kind of per day center or care home basis, uh, but I'd be very happy to hear your thoughts on how to actually perhaps scale this up a bit better. It is a similar kind of a leading on comment from Graham Bunting, and I think maybe there could be, maybe we loop this out, and if you're happy, uh, here, maybe people could write, Sam, if you could put our email address in from the Dementia Research UEA, if you send your interest, and we can forward them to Keir, maybe to create a, uh, if there's an interest, if you're happy with that, Keir, yeah? yeah. Uh, just a final question I had uh, from Elena is, you mentioned PCA and being registered visually impaired. Is this something that is currently possible or just being explored or advocated for? So I, I can signpost to two things. First of all, is a review by neuro-ophthalmologist Gordon Plant, I think is the senior author, where 
he makes a recommendation that people with posterior cortical atrophy, I think even if their visual acuity is spared, might still be considered to be registered as being partially sighted or indeed blind in more severe cases. Uh, and that's in addition, so that article I can share as part of follow-on materials for this meeting, um, but that's in addition to the article I've mentioned as well uh, within the Lancet Neurology. Great, and I'm just sharing uh, my screen just to um, say, uh, so we're having, there's another special event happening actually next week, hosted by Saba Sami on uh, dementia after lockdown, which is looking at some speakers looking in particular at how Mediterranean diet and physical exercise and music therapy can support dementia after lockdown finished. So if you're interested, please again, email us under this email address and that's next week, Thursday at uh, 2 p.m. And for this series, the next event is in September, which is Naoko Kishita. And she basically developed a web-based acceptance and commitment therapy for family carers. And uh, basically she's presenting the findings from her feasibility trial on the 24th of September. So again, email us if you want to be on the email list for any future events, um, which I think will be also really interesting uh, because a lot of things now with now started this work long before COVID, but COVID has web-based interventions made now very, 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 um, you know, relevant, of course. And just finally to say, Sam, if you could put a feedback form into the chat. So if you have a feedback form, if you want to leave feedback or again, register to our email list, uh, then um, the feedback form is now in the chat. And maybe again, if you can just put in our, our uh, email address. And just to say thank you again for Kia for a fantastic presentation. It was really great, Kia. And thank you so much for taking the time to come and talk to us today. And um, thank you all. And um, well, I hope you have a lovely summer. You're free to go. <laughs>